Okay, so looks like everything's starting to work. Um, streaming on. Yeah, that's us live on everything. So hello everyone who's watching this in recorded format. Um, this is a live Q&A, so hopefully we get a few people coming in asking a few questions. Um, if you have already tuned in, seeing a few people have already, this is a Q&A, so ask as many questions as you can, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, as you've noticed, this is not Ben. <laughs> this is what not Ben looks like. Um, my name's Tom. I'm the BTN Academy Manager. Um, I'm also the co-host of the podcast. If you've heard my voice but not seen my face before, that's why. Um, but yeah, this is a live Q&A. Ask as many questions as you can and we'll get some cool content going. If you don't ask any questions, this will be by definition a rubbish Q&A. So get asking away. We're live on two different kinds of Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and apparently Periscope, because that's still a thing. Um, so yeah, Ben grew a beard and grew a top knot quite quickly. This is not a top knot. This is a small developing ponytail that will one day be a proper ponytail, but these things take time. I appreciate you not calling that a top knot. <laughs> uh, afternoon, Tommy, how you doing? Um, yeah, Ben also can't grow a beard this good. So here we are. Yes, so I can see more and more people tune in, which is cool. This is live Q&A. Do ask a question or it'll be rubbish. Um, we're just going to sit here and talk about my hair and beard and the fact that I'm not Ben for the next five minutes before I leave. Um, yes, you should apologize. That is something that you should apologize for. Accusing people of having top knots is just rude. <laughs> We haven't had any questions yet, so I will just witter on about something. Um, so in the most recent Ben Coomber Radio podcast that we did, um, that was released, I believe it was released yesterday, um, we talked an awful lot about food additives and where these ways that you can, you can find out information about the stuff that's in our food, because some people do get a little bit um, nervous about some foods that are in the food chain because they look at them, they don't recognize the ingredients, they don't know what they are. And that's a perfectly valid reason to be concerned about food. Um, but what I would usually suggest that people do is actually, if you're not someone who's into reading nutrition research, maybe you don't know how to get a hold of it, maybe you don't know how to get a hold of the, um, the full text or anything like that, the simplest way that you can find out information about what an ingredient is when you've read about it on a food label is to literally look at the Wikipedia page. Now, I know we were all told back in the day, and as you're always told through education, that Wikipedia is not a reliable source. And the reason it's not a reliable source for education purposes is because it's basic, it's not peer reviewed, um, and the information literally anyone could update it, and so it could theoretically be wrong. So for academic purposes, Wikipedia is a poor source. But for just general use purposes, Wikipedia is a perfectly reasonable source if you're looking to investigate the, the broad spectrum of something. And finding food ingredients on Wikipedia is a really useful way for people to understand what those food ingredients are, to see if they've been registered as safe, to see if there's any health concerns. The articles tend to be quite broad scoped and they tend to be quite informative. So yeah, if you don't recognize a, an ingredient on a food label, I, mean, I wish I'd mentioned this in the podcast, you can literally look it up on Wikipedia and get reasonably good information about it. I don't recommend you get all your nutrition information from Wikipedia, um, but it's not as bad of a source as everyone seems to think it is just because when it was first initially brought out, everyone was really concerned and it seems as though it never lost that reputation, but it is a decent source of information. So, um, Aptitude Fitness Cheltenham, I'm guessing that is. What is the best advice a PT you can give a new client initially about nutrition? Um, oh, the, I mean, the first thing that I think everyone needs to know, and this is really trite, and I get hit sick of hearing it as well, um, but people do need to know that it's calorie balance that dictates weight loss and gain. Like, that is a boring thing. It is not everything you need to know about nutrition by a long way, but it's an incredibly important foundation from which to begin. Because if you don't start from that foundation, you can go off in all sorts of really weird places. So yeah, people need to understand calorie balance. After that, I would probably say the most important thing is that individual food choices don't matter as much as people think they do. Um, people tend to overthink individual food choices quite dramatically. And if you can talk to people and get people into the mindset of thinking that it's total calories that are going to dictate weight and it's the total, it's the totality of their diet that is going to influence their health, not each specific food choice throughout the day, I would say that's probably two really useful pieces of advice. Um, the final one 
would probably be to snack less. Most people, if they're looking to lose weight, will benefit dramatically from snacking less. Um, and then you can go into protein and things like that. But you asked for one, so I gave you two. <laughs> um, I'm at that age where top knots aren't going to be a concern. I'm just having a head hair as a success. That's fair enough. We all need, we all get there eventually, I suppose, as blokes. Um, you hear some people say a calorie is a calorie, but surely TEF disproves this. Can you explain, please? So for those who don't know, TEF is a thermic effect of food. It is the um, energy that is expended during the digestion assimilation of energy that's in what you eat. So the thermic effect of food is generally considered to be about 10%. So if you eat 2000 calories, about 10% of those will be used up for the thermic effect. But as M Davis 97, um, so I don't know your name, um, correctly points out the thermic effect is not equal across foods. So just because it's generally stated to be 10%, that doesn't mean it's 10% of everything. Um, the thermic effect of protein is somewhere roughly up to about 20%. Carbohydrates, it's about 8%. Fats, it's about 2 to 3%. So what that tells us is if you eat 100 calories of protein, you will get fewer calories than if you eat 100 calories of fat or carbohydrate um, and so on. But it's not just the thermic effect, because what you're pointing out there is an overarching principle that's very important. The amount of energy that you actually digest from foods is not equal. One thing that is quite interesting is that up until not too long ago, almonds were believed to have more calories in than they do. Because if you look at the package on almonds, they've got 600 and something calories per 100 grams. And... Until very recently, that was thought to be the amount of calories that you get. And the way that that was assessed is using something called, something called a bomb calorimeter, which is it's a machine that extracts all of the energy from a food, in this case almonds. And by doing that, you understand the exact amount of energy that is present in that food. But that doesn't tell you how much energy the human body gets from it. Something that's being present in the food and something that's able to be absorbed by the human body is completely different things. And in fact, the calories in almonds, you get you excrete about 25 to 30 percent of them. And so the, the principle that you're basically pointing out there is you hear people say a calorie is a calorie, but surely that's not the case because the digestion absorbs and the availability of the calories in foods differs. And that's true, but that doesn't disprove the calorie in calorie out equation. It just tells you that the calorie in calorie out equation is often, mis often misunderstood because the true way to really think about that equation is calories expended across the course of the day versus calories absorbed factoring in the thermic effect. If you can factor in the thermic effect, which you generally can by just eating a balanced diet, at which point it becomes about 10%, then it, 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 it all is much of a muchness. I mean, if you're looking at the extremes, so if you were to take someone who's eating an extremely high protein diet versus someone eating an extremely low protein diet, at that point, calories in versus calories out gets a little bit difficult to look at because because of those two extremes the thermic effect means that there's a big difference between the two intakes but realistically on a practically balanced diet that's when it, it, it doesn't matter so much the same goes as if you look at highly processed foods versus non-processed foods if someone's eating a very highly processed food diet versus someone eating a whole foods diet that's really rich in, in fiber um, the absorption rate will be very different between those diets and so that's when calorie balance what you would assume would work doesn't work so well but assuming that people are eating roughly balanced diets of mostly whole foods um it's a lot easier to account for but no everything that you can look at to suggest that actually calories in versus calories out doesn't work um that's already factored in by people who truly understand calories in versus calories out and and the intricacies involved because, yeah, as you said, it's not as simple as looking at, at food packets and then comparing it to what's on your Fitbit. Um, what's your opinion on colostrum-based protein? It seems to agree with me better than some other protein supplements and seem to get good results, just wondering. Um, I don't know a great deal about it. Um, as far as I'm aware, colostrum is like the bit of milk that comes out of, like, at the start, when milk starts to be removed from an animal. Um, I don't know a huge amount about it, so... I can't really comment a great deal, but if you found a protein that agrees with you or stomach better than other proteins, then you should probably go with that. Um, let's have a look. Uh, when did you know you wanted to stop working in a commercial gym and start the journey I'm on today? Um, I never actually worked in a commercial gym. I worked out of private gyms and 
to be honest, the main thing it, that it was for me was that I just, I feel like this way I get to help more people. Um, I mean, the journey that I'm on today, so working with BTN Academy, working with the podcast and stuff, like that was a really privileged position that was offered to me. And I thought it would, I would have been a bit foolish to turn it down. Um, like I'm, I feel like I'm in a really fortunate position that I can help and work with like literally hundreds of people every year. So it was quite an easy decision for me. At the end of the day, what I wanted to do when I first started out was I wanted to help people to experience fitness and nutrition and the benefits that it gave to me. Um, I think that's probably a reason that a lot of people get into this industry. And and I was just afforded an opportunity to be able to do that in a more direct fashion. Now, I still do some PT. Um, so I always make sure I've got at least one face-to-face -face client at all times. And I've also still got a few online clients. Um, I think it's important for me to be able to do my job properly, for me to still be working with people. Um, and also, I just love it. I don't think I'll ever completely give it up. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And um, what would be the re best route to go down regarding working with eating disorders clients with nutrition? I have an opportunity to possibly help people along my support work with BEAT. Um, so, yeah, if you're wanting to work in the area of eating disorders, um, I would recommend getting in touch with charities such as BEAT because they're going to give you the easiest entry into that without having a whole bunch of um different qualifications behind you now of course if you are wanting to work more clinically in that area um it was probably going to require additional education so i'll probably seek out the best thing to do would be to find some positions that you want to work in and then talk to people in those positions and ask them what they did or speak to like i don't know say you say there's a therapist who's working in a position that you think you'd be fantastic at and you want to work in eating disorders that's the area you really want to work in um find that person and just find out what the requirements were for their job. And that's what you're going to have to work towards. Thank you. Great beard. I appreciate that. Uh, let's have a look at some questions from not Instagram. I'll come back to Instagram in a minute. Uh, can you explain why carbs aren't meaningfully stored as fat? Yeah, sure. So carbohydrate are, well, carbohydrate is different to fat, obviously. Um, it's completely different molecules. And in order for something to be stored as fat, so in the form of triglycerides, which is the form of fat that is stored within the human body, that molecule of glucose needs to be converted into a molecule of triglycerides and, well, into a molecule of fatty acid, which is then combined into a triglyceride. You basically need to turn one thing into something else, and that requires a pathway. The pathway that you do that through is de novo lipogenesis, and in humans, it is incredibly inefficient. It works very well in rodents, and it works very well in some other animals. But the process of de novo lipogenesis doesn't work very well at all in humans. And so it's pretty much impossible to store glucose to any meaningful degree in dietary fat. You see this in, um, like there's quite a few overfeeding studies where you'll take people and put them in a lab and overfeed them by like 500 grams of carbs. And they'll gain something like 12 grams of fat per day. Um, the rest of that isn't really stored as body fat. Now, there are there is some amount of fat that is created out of glucose in the liver. Um, but it's a relatively small amount. It's like a few grams per day at most, which is not going to massively influence body fat. But unfortunately, it can influence liver fat and because you don't need as much of it to create a problem. And so that's how you can get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But generally speaking, carbohydrates are not meaningfully stored as fat in humans because the pathway to be able to do that, de novo lipogenesis, just doesn't really work in us, which is something that's quite fortunate. Um, if you gain body fat, you are storing the dietary fat that you're eating, which is not to say that eating fat causes fat gain because we all know that it's calories that dictates that. But if you are in a calorie surplus and you're gaining fat, the fat that you are storing was the dietary fat that you ate. But the calorie surplus is necessary for that to happen. Otherwise, your body would just use that dietary fat for other stuff. Um, I've seen a physio and he says, I've got golfer's syndrome. Um, I'm guessing that's golfer's elbow. Um, my wrist hurts in some positions as well, the inside of my forearms. My hand from my little finger to middle get extremely numb when lying down or asleep. It's quite painful and shaking them off a few times. That sounds grim, dude. Is this common for people who've been lifting years, five days a week? Um, I would say it's not overly common. It's not something that I've heard of, to be honest. Um, lifting weights shouldn't cause injuries. Like, yes, you will get some niggles, 
but those niggles happen because we all do things that we shouldn't. Um, maybe we sacrifice form somewhere. Maybe we're a little bit fatigued and we don't have everything as tight as it should be when you perform on a lift. Um, maybe your technique's not quite right. I mean, on something like golfer's elbow, it could literally be the elbow position's a little bit off when you're doing curls, which is just placing a little bit too much pressure on one side of the arm. I believe golfer's elbow is the inside and tennis is the outside. It could, it could be the other way around. Um, but yeah, it could literally be something as simple as that. So if you don't have your joints aligned in the right way when you're doing an exercise over and over and over and over again, that's going to eventually cause some amount of pain. Um, but no, I would say that's not particularly common. And once you've rested and, and the golfer's elbow has gone away, it might be worth speaking to um, some kind of coach, some kind of exercise professional who's able to just check you out and just make sure you're doing everything right. Um, Jenny says, second question, if someone takes steroids and builds muscle mass beyond their, beyond their genetic capability, but then stops taking steroids, are they able to maintain this extra muscle mass? Um, to an extent, they will probably maintain a bit. Um, so what we do know is in long-term research, people who have, well, steroid use over the long term doesn't just create more muscle. Um, it creates a whole bunch of infrastructure that's necessary for you to gain muscle in the first place. And some of that infrastructure is things like increased nucleation. So you, your muscle fibers have more than one nucleus. And in order for you to gain more muscle fibers, you need to gain more nuclei. They don't go away once you've come off the steroids. Similarly, you need something called satellite cells, which are kind of like stem cells, but in your muscles. And increased satellite cells around the muscle cells enable you to build more muscle. You get increased satellite cell proliferation in people who've used steroids, and that seems to be a permanent change, which is one of the reasons why um, in tested sports, so sports when you can when you can't take steroids, um, in my opinion, it's not fair to enable X users of steroids to compete in those sports because those X users will still be benefiting. In terms of like, if you end up looking like Kai Green and then you come off steroids, no, you ain't going to maintain that because protein turnover happens all the time. So muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein breakdown happens all the time. And one of the ways that steroids increase your muscle mass is they elevate the amount of muscle protein synthesis. Um, and that enables you not only to gain muscle, but to maintain it because that breakdown's happening all the time and the synthesis needs to happen all the time as well to balance it out. And once you've been using steroids, if you come off steroids, then that muscle protein synthesis will reduce. So yeah, you will lose size. If you see someone who's enormous and they're using gear and then you see them again 10 years later, they ain't going to be as big, even if they're training really hard, if they've come off. It's a really cool question. Um, have a look back to Instagram. Any tips or resources on binge eating? I exercise daily and most days I can keep to my calorie deficit, but sometimes I feel mentally a binge eating session is unavoidable. 4,000 calories in an hour on average. Um, honestly, that's where I would probably recommend you do check out the resources on BEAT. Um, so I think it's BEAT eating disorders. Yeah, if you type in BEAT eating disorders on Google, that will bring up a whole bunch of useful things. Now, I'm not saying that you have an eating disorder, but regular binge eating to the extent of 4,000 calories in an hour is a disordered eating practice, and BEAT will have some really useful resources for you there. Um, I don't really know a huge deal about yourself, so I can't give you a more specific answer than that. But hopefully looking at the binge eating resources on there, that would give you a bit more information. Um, binge eating disorder is something that I've previously described as the hidden eating disorder because it's one that's not spoken about, but it's the most common eating disorder, especially among men. So, yeah, I would check, check out their resources and see if there's something useful in there. Um, Thoughts on consuming a gallon of whole milk a day for muscle gain, as Jason suggested it for my goals. So the Jason in question here is Jason Blaha. Um, well, look, whole milk's incredibly nutritious. If you don't have any particular sensitivities to it, it can be a really useful source of both protein and calories and fats and nutrients. Whole milk is a really good food. And the thing is with drinking a whole a gallon of whole milk a day, um, like you don't have to do that forever. But if you're someone that struggles with a small appetite, it's an incredible way to get a lot of calories in you. And again, what the, the other thing is, if you're being coached by someone, they'll have an awful lot of context that I don't have. And so if your coach has recommended that, I would always just discuss it with them. I, I don't I don't like it if if people get recommended by something by a coach, I don't really want to comment on it because I don't know the situation. I don't like second guessing coaches. Um 
but I've seen a lot of people use the go mad gallon of milk a day approach and getting great success with it. If you've got any amount of lactose, lactose intolerance, it'll absolutely ruin you. But being someone from the north of Europe, you probably don't have that issue. Um, Body X course says, Hey, Ben, this isn't Ben, this is his more attractive co host. <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts on the negative impact of too much exercise, a musculoskeletal cardiac uh, MND risk? Where's the balance? So too much of anything by definition is bad. Um, that's why it's too much rather than just lots. And it's definitely the case that doing too much exercise is a problem for the reasons that you've listed. You can get musculoskeletal issues. So if you overexercise, you're more prone to injury, um, be they either catastrophic acute injuries like a broken leg because you're that fatigued or more likely it'll be overuse injuries. Um, and overuse injuries aren't just because you've done a specific exercise lots of times. An overuse injury can happen because you're doing an exercise lots of times in a fatigued state, which means that your technique's not as good as it could be. So if you overexercise, you are just asking for an injury. You've also got cardiac issues. There are, there's a, a really weird phenomenon where people who exercise a lot are quite prone to heart attacks. Um, it's something to do with, um, hypertrophy in the cardiac muscle so your heart gets too big um hypertrophy is usually considered to be a good thing but a problem with um i think it's ventricular hy hypertrophy i'm not a cardiac doctor but one of the parts of your heart gets really big if you exercise lots and lots and lots we're talking like ultra marathon athletes here we're not talking someone that goes to the gym six times a week instead of five um but because that of that hypertrophy it actually stiffens the muscle up a little bit so having heart hypertrophy is a good thing right up until it isn't. Um, MND risk, I'm not sure what you mean by that, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know if that's a typo or me just not understanding the, the acronym. Um, where's the balance? Practically speaking, as far as exercise goes, the balance for most people is the minimum amount of exercise that you need to do to get the results that you need. There's a really common uh, phrase in endurance racing, which is junk miles. So. Junk miles in endurance racing is just running some miles, even though they don't necessarily have a training benefit. You're just running them because you're running them. It's just additional training volume. And you could transfer that over to hypertrophy training or strength training and call it junk reps. It's a set of deadlifts after you've done enough deadlifts to create the amount of stimulus that you need to grow. Um, so rather than looking at it as the case of what is too much exercise, so trying to find yourself a cap, I would try to find yourself the bottom amount. How much do you actually need to do to get the adaptations that you want to get? And it's probably not as much as you need. Um, there's a fantastic article. I think it's called Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris Beardsley. Um, he writes a lot on medium.com and he's got, he wrote a really, really fantastic evidence-based article that suggests that something like 15 uh, effective, was it 15 effective reps? Was, anyway, if you check out Chris Beardsley's blogs on medium.com, he discusses the actual amount of exercise that is required to get the most amount of benefit. And the amount of exercise, what well, the amount of resistance training that you need to do to maximize hypertrophy isn't that much. Um, it works out at something like three or four set hard sets per muscle group per session. Do that twice a week and you've grown. Um, and then when it comes to endurance racing, you can look at ultramarathon runners and they aren't running as much as a lot of people who are trying to become ultramarathon runners. So, yeah, don't look at what is the most amount of exercise that I can handle. Look at what is the least amount of exercise that I need to achieve the goal that I want. And the more lofty goal you have, the more exercise that's going to be. But it's not going to be hours and hours every day. Nobody trains like that. Also, make sure you are, um, you're periodizing your training. Your training shouldn't be hard all the time. It should be really hard sometimes and not very hard the rest of the time. Um, and that should go in some sort of planned out fashion. Don't just like beat your head against the wall until you can't do it and have a week off. Like it should be planned out. Make sure you're using periodization. Um, do you have any advice on females going through premature menopause? My partner's tried everything to lose weight while on HRT, but can't seem to lose much body fat while taking it. We've tried several different HRT, not much luck though. She suffers with poor sleep and night sweats. She will. Um, as far as I'm, I'm, I don't have any personal experience with it, 
but from what I've heard, menopause is a rough time. Um, there's some amount of evidence that zinc and magnesium supplementation can potentially help reduce the night sweats. Um, it's more specifically zinc, I think, is the one that makes the big difference. And the other one is soy isoflavones. I seem to be very beneficial. So soy, iso soy isoflavones may be something that you want to investigate. They don't like massively change the outcomes that you're going to get, but they can potentially reduce some of the symptoms. There's a, a reasonable amount of evidence for both of those, so they could be worth investigating. Obviously, if you're looking at supplement with zinc, just check that there's not plenty of zinc in the diet already because overtaking zinc isn't a good idea. Um, so that's the, the only real advice I can give, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of trying to lose weight, what I always say to everyone, if you're really tr struggling to lose weight, like stop for a week. Try to maintain for a week and during that week, reassess exactly what you're doing and what you need to do and why you're doing it. Like if someone's going through, like if someone is perimenopausal, is that the time when they need to be really focused on reducing their waist circumference? Um, if it's for health purposes, then yeah, sure. But if they're already a reasonably healthy weight, um, could you look during that time to focus on other areas? So improving your cardiovascular fitness, making sure you're doing resistance training to avoid the osteoporosis and sarcopenia that can happen during the menopause or after the menopause at least. Um, and just, just assess that. At the end of the day, the menopause doesn't invalidate the calorie balance equation. And so if someone is consuming fewer calories than they expend, they will lose weight. The problem is during the menopause, that can be quite difficult because it's it, it's very difficult to maintain that level of activity. It's very difficult to maintain all of that because you get tired. And so there it is. Uh, Long Shrimp on Periscope says that I look young and old at the same time. I'll take that as a compliment because it means I won't get ID'd. Um, no, this is just what we look like in the north. It's shit up here and this is what bad weather does to your face. Um, Thumbs up there, thumbs up there. Cool, I think we had another question up here, actually. Yeah. Uh, ah, no, cool, so that's all the questions. Awesome. Well, guys, um, if you've got any more, I'll be on for like another, I don't know, sort of 30, 45 seconds, so if you've got another question and you're like furiously typing, uh, get that sent. But otherwise, cheers very much for tuning in. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate you taking a little bit of time out your Friday to listen to me with her on. Um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope this has been useful and I'm sure I will speak to you soon. So it looks like we've got no more questions. That'll do. Awesome guys. Thanks very much. I'm sure I'll catch you all again.